Hi judges, we are team Call U19 from Singapore. Our team consists of, from left to right, Aiden, Roger, Aku and Glenda. In order to complete the mission, our robot first needs to be able to traverse the line elements in the field. This includes blank intersections, sharp 90 degree bends, line gaps, rapid direction changes and gentle curves. A robot also needs to be able to recognize the effect zone entry, effect zone exit, as well as where the mission ends. In order to do that, we are using two color sensors to sense the color of the ground. These two color sensors are spaced 4 cm apart, such that the sensor's neutral position are at the double white uh, lines on the edge of the line, and any cross-track error will result in changes in the reflected light intensity. Later on, Glenda will talk about how we use these color sensors data for the PID software in order to track the line tightly. The two sensors are also positioned as close to the center of gravity of the robot as possible. This is very important because our robot drives on tank treads and during steering, the robot's pivot point of turning is right below the center of gravity. Having the color sensors close to the pivot point allows the robot to follow the line tightly and minimize the chance where the color sensors exceed the line while turning a tight corner. For the software, the robot navigates the line by using proportional double line track. It calculates the difference between the left and right color sensor readings, multiplies it by a proportionality constant, and outputs a steering value. The translational speed is then adjusted based on the steering speed. By doing so, the robot can react on small errors and this enables a smoother line track. When we are calibrating the sensors, we face the problem of a bumpy field. The creases will affect the distance between the sensors and the ground, creating abnormally bright points, which will affect the range of the color sensors. Hence, our solution was to statically calibrate the sensors over continuous updates. We use the calibrated readings rather than the raw readings for the sensor, so this enables consistent comparison between both sensors even if their raw RGB values are different. By detecting the color and objects, we use the average distance method. First, we convert each RGB reading to a HSV value, which has the different colors in the color space, as well as from cylindrical to Cartesian coordinates. Then, we calculated the average distance for three readings to each color centroid and compared it to the threshold. The HSV plot below shows the points for the black and white colors, as well as the green cluster, which are the green colored points. First, the robot will detect the red line by checking the left and right color sensor red distances. If the red line is detected, the robot will line track for 3 seconds and end the program. Next, the robot must also complete the intersection scenarios. There are 4 different scenarios as shown in the diagram. First, the robot will detect the presence of a black intersection. If the robot sees black, then it will ignore any readings for the next 50 loops. This is done by using a double black counter which is set to 50 and it will decrement with time. After the 50 loops, the robot will run the first check to see if any sensor sees green. If this is true, the robot will line track until a black intersection is met and at the meantime it will constantly update if each sensor detected green. Finally, it will run over the different scenarios and run the appropriate movements. Another part of the mission is, our robot also needs to be able to traverse through 3D field elements. This includes speed bumps, as well as up and down ramps. These field elements prompted us to use a track system instead of a two-wheel drive or a four-wheel drive system. We chose tracks over two-wheel drive and four-wheel drives because it has the most points of contact with the ground. So it gives the least chance of skidding or getting stuck while traversing speed bumps. Another consideration for our robot to pass the speed bumps that all hardware attachments have to be at least 1 cm above the ground, especially the grab and lift cloth, since it is located all the way at the front. We eventually settled on having a cloth 14 mm above the ground because it is the most uh, convenient way to build it. Now, given the 14 mm ground clearance for the cloth, we input the dimensions of the key parts of our robot into SketchUp and found that for a ground clearance of 14 mm, cloth can maximally protrude by 17.2 mm beyond the edge of the tracks or else it will hit the ramp before the robot tracks even move up the ramp. We eventually settled on 16mm protrusion length, which is just nice the width of two Lego beams. 
Another consideration for passing up and down ramps is that our robot's center of gravity has to be as low as possible to prevent the robot from tipping over when tilted on the ramp. Lastly, in order to reduce the protrusion length of the claw, the main color sensor, which is used to detect objects and obstacles, is attached at an angle, as shown, as bo as shown in the bottom diagram. Now for the last section, which involves how the robot um, interacts with the rescue kit, obstacle, live, dead victims, and the deposit box. For the claw, we have built a grab and lift system so that we can use only one motor to grab the object and lift it into the sorter. The claw is angled so that the ball or rescue kit will center itself as the robot moves forward. The claw is the same width as the robot so that it can sweep a large area at once in the exact zone. Flat gripper design that fits nicely to the sides of the cube for better gripping of the cube. The rubber on the claw will increase the friction on it while contouring to the object. This increases the grip. The objects will be stored inside two sorting trays. There are railings on the sides so that the rescue kit and balls cannot fall off the sorting trays. The right tray is narrower so that the rescue kit will not get stuck on its corners and the flat side of the cube will always be at the bottom. The sorting trays are also tilted downwards so that the balls and rescue kit will make space for anything that will be sorted into the same sorting tray. The sorting mechanism will sort the victims into the sorting trays. The motor turns clockwise or anti-clockwise to push the objects into the respective tray. There is a small lever built into the sorting trays so that when it pushes against the evacuation zone, the sorting tray will pivot upwards and due to gravity, the rescue kit and victims can go out. While line tracking, there are two objects that the robot can detect, the obstacle and the rescue kit. So the rescue kit comes first in terms of priority and it's detected when the RGB readings are closer to the Euclidean distance of the blue centroid. And if it's so, then it picks up the cube. If not, then it's an obstacle, which it then has to go around by a constant angular velocity. And this is done by keeping two different linear velocities on each other tracks, where the further track has a higher linear velocity and it's calculated using that formula there. Then we have the evacuation zone and we chose to do sweep strategy because it covers everything on the evacuation zone. A gyro sensor and proportional controller were required because there were errors and uh, the error would build up slowly. So the gyro sensor just removes that error. Then when our robot is sweeping around, it'll detect for green and blue lines. And if it does, it'll remember the lane number as seen in the diagram there. The victims are then collected and detected by the, if the RGB value is greater than 20. And also if the robot has traveled more than 95 CM, then it will make a forced deposit. Then when detecting the victims, the RGB readings are taken. And if let's say the RGB reading is closer to the orange centroid than the white centroid, then it's a dead victim. And then it goes into the left channel, else it goes in the right channel. Then to deposit, since the robot already remembers where the deposit box was, it just simply goes back. And what it does is it, it turns at angles to deposit each channel. Then the sort motor actually turns to the opposite channel so that that channel is locked and it doesn't fall out. Then to exit, again, it remembers where the exit was. So what it does, it performs a series of moves as seen on the slide, and then it proceeds to exit based on which line it has to exit from, whether it be X, uh, blue or green. So this was the summary of the task breakdown, and the next slide has the main program flow chart. Our robot has collected one white ball and the cube. It is depositing them now. Next, it will leave the evac zone. We think that one area of improvement is that instead of sweeping, a robot can search for the ball's exact position. That will be more efficient. Now, the robot is traversing the line elements. We think that our hardware and software designs have enabled our robot to be very robust and it can travel through the line elements with little difficulty even though they are different for different mats. So this is one important aspect we would like to highlight to other teams about our robot. Overall, RCAT was a very enriching experience for us as we faced many challenges such as the robot not being able to pass through big line gaps or speed bumps with zigzag. Nevertheless, we learned how to overcome them by tuning our robot 
and we managed to solve the challenge. Thank you.